please be seated and make sure cell phones are turned off. Mr. Panettiere, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, so I wanted to talk to you about some literature where people have gotten sick from cosmetic talc um, that uh, JJ didn't talk a lot about. But um, starting in the 80s and then all the way up until last year, you have cosmetic talc. One proposes the source when they find tremolite and thophylite in primarily the lungs of women because you had a lot of women using cosmetics. Um, they're saying that that is attributable to cosmetic talc. And then uh, Andrian, in 1994, that was the case of the man who, or a young man, um, who put on, who had a habit of putting on this powder and had a very, very short latency period. And that was attributed to that cosmetic talc. And the reason was because they looked in his lungs and they found tremolite. Um, and then moving on, Gordon, in 2014, that is the study of the cosmetic talc made by Kashmir Bouquet. Um, and we know that some of that has the same source as the J&J, where they looked in the lungs of a woman and found um, amphibole asbestos. And then Marinaccio, five cases of mesothelioma in women due to intensive talc use. This is a good example because Marinaccio, once, they actually said in their paper that, um, I think it was yesterday that you saw this, that once they became aware, they had a previous paper from years earlier, and then they had seen some recent publications about talc, asbestos and talc, they went back and looked at their registry and they found something they hadn't noted before as being important, which was the cosmetic use of five cases of mesothelioma. So see, the doctors are on a learning curve too as far as what's actually out there. And a lot of that has to do, is, uh, to do with when are we getting these documents. So Gordon, uh, like I told you, it was a study of cashmere bouquet, and um, Ms. Sullivan kind of scribbled it out, uh, but it's relevant to Johnson's because they did share a common ore source for the early years. So we had showed you that earlier. Um, this is from the deposition you uh, saw of Dr. Nicholson, Susan Nicholson. I just want to show you a, a quick clip. And can we agree that studies that Johnson & Johnson were aware of demonstrate that um, both talc and asbestos have been found in women who are not occupationally exposed to asbestos. Yes. And the reason I show you that is for Johnson & Johnson's own awareness. She said Johnson & Johnson knew about this. Risk. Okay, risk. I want to talk to you about risk because in this case, um, and Ms. Sullivan talked about it as well, in 1986, the FDA did that response to the citizens petition where they assessed a theoretical risk. And the theoretical risk they assessed was pretty, pretty insane. It was somewhere between 1 in 100 million and 1 in 11 billion, which is 4 more billion people than now live on the planet. Okay? They didn't have any information from then tested or anything recent. They hadn't seen anything since the early 1970s. But I'm going to show you about that. Risk. So the citizens petition. We know it was filed on November 8, 1983. It was rejected on uh, July 11, 1986. We showed you the document where the FDA actually called Johnson & Johnson and gave them a heads up on January 4, about two months later, 1984, right? Now why is the FDA calling J&J and giving them a heads up? Right? What do they have to do with it? Then there are two risk assessments that are done over the next year, right? And we saw those. Those are those theoretical risk assessments. Dr. Brown's risk assessment has a footnote 11, which pointed us to a document that was generated um, in June of 1984, where John Weninger had called, uh, who after he had called J&J, &J, he had already denied his citizen's petition before there was any risk assessment. Okay? I don't know why he did it. Um, we don't have any evidence of that. All we know is that when Dr. Brown did his risk assessment. He cited the footnote 11, which was denial of citizen's petition by Philip Dulay by John Weninger. It was denied before it was ever actually rejected. Objection. And before characterizing that. Stop the speaking objections. Overruled. Continue. 
And so it was denied before they ever actually did the risk assessments. And then, of course, it was rejected in 1986. But, but let's look at some of the things they actually had at their disposal. Um, this, again, is from Dr. Nicholson. What's documented in here is that Johnson & Johnson actually provided the FDA with information in order to assess the citizen petition, correct? Yes. And uh, what's documented is the FDA specifically told Johnson & Johnson that they don't have any data on currently marketed top products, correct? Yes. Yet at this point in time, you had not provided, you still did not provide the FDA with any further testing evidence related to um, whether there was asbestos in the general baby powder, correct? Correct. Okay. So this is a month after the first heads up. So this is February. And the FDA says, we don't have any current testing information. And Johnson Johnson says, okay. They don't give them any. Then they, the FDA comes up with this one in a hundred thousand, a hundred million risk assessment. It was all theoretical. There were no actual dust studies done uh, and nothing provided by Johnson & Johnson. I asked, remember, um, actually this isn't my question. This is Ms. Sullivan's question of Dr. Hopkins. And doctor, are you aware of whether the FDA did extensive analysis and testing of talcum powder in response to this petition? Yes. They did testing of talcum powders, and they reviewed the literature and the data they had in their own files. And that was not true. Um, because the FDA the citizen's petition itself says, no analysis of cosmetic talc have been performed by FDA since 79. So Hopkins, I'm sure you picked up on this. Whatever Dr. Hopkins felt um, was desired by the Johnson & Johnson lawyer, he, he testified to. Um, and that's what he felt uh, he wanted there, and that's what he gave. But it wasn't true. Um, and by the way, I put a little one down there at the bottom. That's just, I'm going to count misleading statements, okay? I'm not going to count all of them, but I'm just going to count some. The FDA does not regulate cosmetic talc. And I just feel like I have to say this because whatever you've heard in the case from the lawyers or anybody, they don't regulate it. And Johnson & Johnson in their own sworn interrogatory says, Johnson's baby powder is not an FDA-regulated product. The involvement of the FDA is very passive. They don't have the power to recall. They only have the authority to monitor. And that's it. Objection. Overruled. But there's actual evidence of risk. So we have this theoretical risk assessment that the FDA did in 1986, right? And then we have the actual evidence of risk found in Johnson & Johnson's files. And what's in evidence, it came into evidence um, uh, yesterday, is 300 plus internal reports over a period of two years. 300 plus reports over a period of two years. Now these are the reports that Johnson & Johnson generated based on, as Ms. Sullivan said, lawsuits that were filed. These aren't just lawsuits though. They were lawsuits that were filed that Johnson & Johnson then went and looked at the medical information for those people and they did an assessment on all of those people. These are 300 plus cases of mesothelioma for people who say they use Johnson's baby powder. Okay. And you'll see these. These are in evidence. Johnson & Johnson actually did a medical evaluation on these and confirmed whether or not they had mesothelioma and also confirmed their other medical issues, whether or not they had other issues going on. So the question, this came up because Dr. Hopkins has said the FDA did a risk assessment. And I said, well, you have these internal reports. Why haven't you done a risk assessment? You could provide these to any of your internal experts or your external experts and actually do a risk assessment based on these internal reports of people who have mesothelioma and use Johnson's baby powder or another one of their top products. But they haven't done that. And Mr. Myman asked Mr. Diet and, Ms. and Dr. Dr. Diet, Dr. Atmus, if they would do that. And Dr. Diet said, no, I wouldn't do it and didn't really give a reason. Dr. Atten said, no, they haven't been given, they haven't been asked. There's 300 of them. Did they do a study? No. Now, not even close. What they did do, and this is in evidence, this is Exhibit 3253, and Counsel for Johnson Johnson showed you this as well. This was the assessment they did of 47 of these cases in uh, February 2017. They looked at 47. What did they do? 
They said because the specification for the talc says no asbestos detected, they presumed there was no asbestos exposure. Okay? So that's kind of circular reasoning. In their assessment to determine if these mesotheliomas came from the baby powder, they said, well, there's no asbestos because our specification says no asbestos. And if there's no asbestos, we're going to rely on studies. We're going to look at studies of non-asbestos talc. And we see no mesotheliomas, which is what they expected to see, and then found no association. That's what they did. That's the assessment they did. That's circular reasoning. Our specification says no asbestos. You don't see mesothelioma without asbestos. And then what did they do? They communicated their findings to the rest of the team. And it was a joke to them. Why do we know it was a joke? Because when he sent the final assessment, they responded, thanks and congratulations, he, he. And this is where I asked Dr. Hopkins, you talk about credibility? Look, this isn't a good document for them. He knows that. But when I said, they, they, they had a little chuckle, right? They wrote it off. They were able to say, none of these are associated. I said, so they had a little chuckle, right? He, he, and he goes, I don't know what that means. You don't know what he, he means? That's a credibility problem. You're the judge of the credibility. And by the way, if you search Johnson's baby powder, and uh, the judge gave an instruction on this in the public database, you get two hits for Johnson's baby powder. But there's actually over 300. And, and the instruction that the court gave was um, that there's a database where because of um, privacy rights and things like that, they take out the trade names. So here's why that's important. Because if you search the public database, you only get two that say Johnson's baby powder and mesothelioma. But internally, there's over 300. So that's what they have. There's a difference between what the public has and what Johnson & Johnson has. It's so not a single one of their internal reports. And this is important. You'll see it. It's in evidence. They file these MedWatch forms, which is a three-page form that I talked to Dr. Hopkins about. That goes to the FDA with all of the personal information redacted like it should be. But the internal assessments, the many, many page assessments, those stay in-house. So the FDA doesn't get what Johnson & Johnson actually has. In the months afterward, so after that assessment, remember that they said, we assess these as not possible because our spec says no asbestos, so it's not possible. They went back. Each of these came after that assessment, and they again assessed them as possible. But more importantly, even more importantly than possible, was they say, no other etiology. Etiology means cause. No other cause. Not age, not spontaneous, not a shipyard, no other cause but the powder that's alleged in the cases. And these are in evidence. They're also in Exhibit 31 and 49. All right. So, but Dr. Diet and Dr. Atanus came here, and what they did is they said, no, all of these are spontaneous. They're all spontaneous. And I want you to recall what, um, what David Etheridge said on the stand. His oncologist said, well, this is just, this is from asbestos. Mesothelioma is from asbestos. It's not spontaneous. None of their doctors said these are spontaneous. No one even thought of that before Dr. Diet and Dr. Atanus came along. Because think about this. That is the only defense. That is the only defense. There's no other exposure to point to, right? The only other defense, there's two things they can do. They can say, yes, these are from asbestos, which is what mesothelioma is, or we can just say they're spontaneous. Dr. Diet and Mr. Myman showed Dr. Diet that this is from the website at Johns Hopkins where he is. He is an expert in asthma and COPD. He is not an asbestos or mesothelioma expert. Okay? How do we know that even more? You can search by areas of research. This isn't just looking for a doctor. You can search by areas of specialty. There are 10 doctors at, at Johns Hopkins that do mesothelioma. He's not one of them. There are 517 that do cancer. He's not one of them. I am sure that Dr. Viet is a great 
asthma and COPD doctor. I'm sure he is. But for courtrooms, he's completely different than what he holds himself out as outside the courtroom. You've got Dr. Brody, who has over 200 publications where he's been researching uh, asbestos his whole life. Dr. Malin, who treats it, is working for the 9-11 Responders Fund. And Dr. Maddox, who has treated many, 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 many mesotheliosis, or diagnosed, because he's a pathologist. One of the things uh, Ms. Sullivan said was Dr. Moline didn't even look at the information until after the lawsuit was filed. And I found that surprising just because earlier in the case, she'd asked the same question, and the judge had issued this instruction, which is, look, the lawsuits were filed saying J&J was the cause before you were asked to even evaluate whether that was true. That appears to be how the system works. And Judge Moscone said, the jury will disregard that remark and that is stricken from the record. Cases are guided by case management order. The court sets discovery time periods which guide when depositions are taken and the time frame in order to provide medical records and retrieve medical records. This is all done pursuant to the court schedule that is set. So to say you didn't do X, Y, or Z until the case was filed is completely misleading because the cases are governed by what's called a CMO, Objection. case management order. Overruled. The spontaneous defense. Let's talk about that. This, to me, is the linchpin of the whole thing. Because Dr. Diet admitted there is no test that a doctor can do to distinguish a spontaneous cancer from a non-spontaneous cancer, correct? Yes. Why is that so important? Because it's utterly untestable. It's utterly untestable. Any expert who has the flexibility to do it can come in and just say, I declare this spontaneous. It is an utterly untestable defense. Spontaneous. Cancer spontaneous. How do you know? I just feel it's spontaneous. It could be. Spontaneous cancers occur. Take my word for it. It's a take my word for it defense. To you smoking games, we're just all familiar with it. Let's say someone smokes their whole life and they get lung cancer, right? They get lung cancer. How do we know that's not spontaneous? Most of us, common sense, we would say, look, if someone smoked their whole life and they got lung cancer, it's from smoking. But because cancers occur spontaneously, how do we know it's not spontaneous? There's no smoke left over in your lungs. Right? There's no smoke left over in your lungs. So how do we know? It could be spontaneous. But we know that's not credible. The spontaneous thing, we all know that anything can happen in medicine, right? We all know that. But for all four, be spontaneous? Then you have Dr. Richard Atmus, and I put expert question mark, because I thought he was a little bit more of a performer than an expert, to be totally honest. Dr. Atmus comes all the way from Cardiff. Okay, the, I think the evidence was that he was a performer. He came in, remember, we're, we're in the US, he came in here, and he stopped halfway up, and he bowed, right? And then he actually said, and he corrected himself, he said, ladies and gentlemen, the audience, you know, jury. And that's how he views it. And what did he do? Every time he talked about any person that he worked with, they were preeminent. Preeminent. Everyone he worked with. They happened to be J&J experts. Right? Dr. Mugalpar, who you heard of, and um, Michelle Carboni. And then his opinions flip-flopped when he started working for asbestos companies. So the evolution of Richard Atmos's opinions, remember? It went from idiopathic. Remember, what is idiopathic? Idiopathic is a person has a disease. We're not going to call it spontaneous. We say they have a disease, but we don't know where they were exposed to whatever the agent is, right? So we've heard all a lot in this case about people who get mesothelioma, and the doctor says, where are you exposed to asbestos? And they say, I don't know. That's idiopathic. It just means you don't know. It doesn't mean they weren't exposed. But Dr. Atanus has started calling that spontaneous. That's extremely, extremely, extremely sly to start calling cancers that are idiopathic. We don't know the cause because they weren't asked to now they're spontaneous. And now he starts calling them naturally occurring. They're just naturally occurring. I, I agree, that sounds better. 
But what he means is spontaneous. And what he gets that from is this concept of idiopathic. Not one piece of literature says you can call something spontaneous if there's asbestos exposure. Not one. They didn't show you a single one. If there's asbestos exposure, it's from the asbestos, the mesothelioma. It's not spontaneous. There's not one bit of science that says that. And then it takes a great deal of moral flexibility to say it's spontaneous in the face of known exposure. Right? And we know it's not just these cases. It's not just these cases. It's cases where Dr. Atenews is testifying for the mining company for raw asbestos. And someone is exposed, oh yeah, it's just this last one, right? And someone is exposed to 100% raw asbestos. And the brain company, spontaneous, spontaneous. <clears throat> it's no surprise that here these are spontaneous too. Is this defense intellectually honest? Well, no, for a number of reasons. But one very clear reason it's not intellectually honest is, what else did they do? And what else did counsel for Johnson Johnson continue to do? Well, maybe they were exposed, right? Maybe Mr. Etheridge was born in Norfolk. There's a shipyard there, right? Okay? But not really. The shipyard's far away. It's in Plymouth. Okay? Uh, Dr. Dr. Maddox pointed that out. But why did they bring that up? Shipyard's an easy target for asbestos, right? Is it spontaneous or is it from a shipyard? Right? Mr. Barton's dad went through Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. Right? He went through it. He went to some other places. What is it? Are they, gonna, are they blaming asbestos exposures, or is it spontaneous? That is why this is not intellectually honest. One, because you can't test, you can't, there's no way to question an expert's opinion when they say it's spontaneous. They just say, I declare it spontaneous. But to also then say, well, maybe it was asbestos. That's not consistent. We know that's not consistent. That's not honest. But the defense is convenient. Um, the Sullivan said, most cancers just happen for no reason. She just said that. And that's very convenient. You know, it's just like saying, we're Johnson Johnson, we're big. You can say this in any case, too, without any evidence. You can bring in Dr. Atnes to say it's spontaneous. But at the very end of his testimony, one of the jurors, well, of course, we don't know who it is, <laughs> asked a question, and Dr. Diet answered it directly. Do markers have to be present in all cases to determine if asbestos was a cause of mesothelioma, whether plural or peritoneal? And his answer was, yeah, so no. What we're talking about, whether markers are common or not, but they're not present in every case where asbestos caused the mesothelioma. No. And I'm glad one of you asked that question. Because he answered it in a straightforward way. This whole concept of plural plaques or markers fiber digestions, tissue digestions, that is a sideshow because the only thing that matters is, is there exposure? And we sh we'll, I'll show you the Helsinki Consensus Report in a minute. But Dr. Diet answered that question straightforward. No, you do not need markers. That was a problem for Johnson & Johnson because that was what they wanted. To be able to say no markers means no asbestos-related mesothelioma. Who came after Dr. Diet? Dr. Atkins. They pivoted. And they went back to Cardiff. So Cardiff in the UK, right? In Wales. Cardiff is where Dr. Wagner came from, Dr. Pooley, and Dr. Atkins, right? You got the rats, the rocks, and old reliable. Okay? Rats, rocks, reliable. And they all worked for the asbestos industry and Johnson and Johnson all of them. It is perfectly fine if you want throughout this trial to say these are preeminent researchers, this is a great university, this is Harvard, this is MIT. At the end of the day, they are people. And what did these people do from Cardiff? They all went here to do their work. So they went and they got Dr. Atanas. And he came here and he, um, we showed you a document where he, he has gone and given speeches at the Defense Research Institute, the voice of the defense bar, right? And he was labeled as a high roller expert. Um, he testifies for Union Carbide, raw asbestos sellers, the brake companies, and he says it's spontaneous. It's always the same. Reliable. 
And then, at the very end of his examination, Mr. Monument said, if we had a full bottle of baby powder, but it wasn't baby powder, it was 100% asbestos, pressed asbestos, and we shook it all over ourselves, over and over again, our whole lifetime, what would be the result of that? No problem. No problem. So the care runs from who he is. That's who he is. And he's the same guy saying, this is spontaneous. You're the judges of the credibility, ladies and gentlemen. He published on this before. He published on this, an analysis of 227 cases of peritoneal mesothelioma from the UK, where 85% had exposure to asbestos, right? And when Mr. Myman confronted him with that, right? Because now he says, oh no, almost none are asbestos related, almost none. He said, oh, well, that was old. That was, I agree, it was from before he started working for all those other guys. I agree, in that respect it's old. There's before and there's after. He wrote this before Johnson & Johnson. It is now appreciated that trivial amphibole asbestos exposures may cause mesothelioma in susceptible individuals and that the risk cannot be adequately controlled by the workplace technology and control regulations. Trivial exposure to amphibole can cause mesothelioma. And then this morning, um, uh, the court gave an instruction here to disregard any of his testimony regarding biomarkers in D'Angelo and McNeil, and that's for legal reasons. Um, and he never said anything about asbestos versus cleavage fragments. Now, internally, this is the document where they looked at the 47 mesotheliomas. Johnson & Johnson says, the association of mesothelioma with asbestos exposure is well established, where asbestos exposure is the cause of more than 80% of mesotheliomas. Okay, so here you heard kind of a different story from Diet, from Atanus. They keep ratcheting the numbers lower and lower. And they keep saying, no, no, it's a smaller and smaller percentage from asbestos. The great majority are spontaneous. Where are all these spontaneous mesotheliomas in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s? Where's all the literature on that? I just thought about that. Where is it? That's a good question. If, if spontaneous was a real cause of mesotheliomas, as much as they're saying it is, where's the, where was the literature on it? Before a tinge came along and started writing about it with Mulgavkar and Michelle Carboni in the 2000s. See, that, that tells you what this is. He met with Bruce Bishop, right, that lawyer, started working for Union Carbide and the great guys, and this is what they came up with. There isn't any literature on this because it wasn't a thing. We showed you some other literature uh, by Welch and et cetera, just to show you that, look, when you get outside of the litigation, here we report a significant association between asbestos exposure and peritoneal mesothelioma. Here's a case, uh, 380 cases of asbestos-related mesothelioma, 77 are peritoneal, all had occupational or non-occupational exposure. And here, of course, we have non-occupational exposure to asbestos for all four. Now, Helsinki consensus, why do we come back to this? It's not because we love Finland. I mean, I'm sure it's great. But it's because this was an international panel of 19 experts who had together written 1,000 articles. And what did they say? A history of significant occupational, domestic, or environmental exposures will suffice for attribution. You do not need asbestosis, pleural plaques, or a tissue analysis to say that mesothelioma is from asbestos. And why is that? Uh, Dr. Diet said, we don't go taking healthy lung tissue from people to analyze it. It's not med medically indicated, right? The biggest marker for asbestos exposure is mesothelioma. Um, Pleuroplaques are rare and most often in heavily exposed groups like insulators. X-rays and CTs are insensitive to pleuroplaques. You don't always pick them up. But here, this to me is the most important slide with regards to the, this marker conversation, which is we've got all these different papers, okay? And you've got trades and you've got different um, categories of people exposed to asbestos in cases where their mesotheliomas were attributed to asbestos. Look at the percentages of the people with the pleural plaques, right? Set aside the insulators. 
The insulators, man, a bunch of them, the great majority had plural plaques, but that's the heaviest exposed group that ex ever existed. For construction, a minority, right? For the Navy, a minority, building, a minority. Um, this one, we talked about the hand spinners, the, the hand spinners of raw asbestos. That was a paper from China called Gao that we discussed with Dr. Brody. 11% had pleural plaques, but they had mesothelioma from asbestos. If we applied the same rubric to these that Dr. Atenus applied here, then it would be, yeah, the other 66% spontaneous. The other 79% here, spontaneous. 54% here, spontaneous. 100% spontaneous, right? But these are all from asbestos. You only get a majority of plural plaques, those markers, with the most heavily exposed people. All of these were asbestos related, and only a small minority in a lot of these cases had pleural plaques. It takes way more exposure to cause pleural plaques than these are doing. It's kind of like saying that 50% of smokers with lung cancer have smoker's cough, right? But if they don't, it must be spontaneous. Right? That's sort of a marker. If someone's got a smoker's cough and they have lung cancer, you go, okay, well, that's that's probably from smoking. But what if they don't have a smoker's cough? And they smoke their whole life. Sort of like saying, well, they don't have this marker of coughing, it must be spontaneous, but we know that's not true. I looked last night in these 300 reports, because I was curious how many of them had reported plural plaques? Five. In those 300 people, five, 0.016%. In these types of exposures, you just don't see them. These are infant exposures. And they are, remember, this is a small percentage of asbestos in this product over a long period of time. Right? Used repeatedly every day. It's not like insulators. It's not like, it's not like asbestos miners or asbestos millers. So you're not going to see plural plaques as much as you're going to see it everywhere else. So a history of asbestos exposure means it's caused by asbestos. That's the Helsinki Consensus Report. That's Johnson & Johnson eternally. We, this document is in evidence that mesothelioma is exclusively caused by asbestos. The only people that said no were Atanus and Johnson and Johnson's lawyers. And, and then I just want to say this. Look, calling these spontaneous steals the truth from these people. It steals the truth from them. They got this cancer, this mesothelioma, because they were exposed to asbestos from the baby powder that they were that was put on them as infants and then they used that the rest of their lives. You come in here and you call it spontaneous, you steal the truth from them. The truth is, this is an asbestos-related disease. Mesothelioma has always been an asbestos-related disease. This idea of spontaneous is newly created. Douglas Barton, 23,449 uses. With regard to his father's exposure, if any, he went to the Brooklyn Navy or the Brooklyn Army base in Brooklyn. He was with the Civil Service but he worked with the Army, he wore a suit, came home in the same suit. No one ever noticed any sort of dust on him. Um, there were suits, they went to the cleaners, no one washed them. There's no exposure there. You're not here to state with reasonable medical certainty that any possible exposure from the Brooklyn Navy Yard caused Doug Burden's mesothelioma. That is correct, that's Dr. Diet. So despite what counsel continues to insinuate, there is no expert that is saying that he has mesothelioma from this. It's just the lawyers who want to say, well, maybe he does. David Etheridge, he had four years of powdering from infancy to three years old, and then later in life, and his total uses was 8,180 times. And remember, his sister was the one who did it. She came and testified. And I asked Dr. Hopkins, I said, Johnson & Johnson knew that siblings would, would help out with mom. You know, and he said, no, I don't do that. And I showed him, this is a guide that Johnson & Johnson put out in 1955. Right? It's a guide. And it says for siblings and students. And he said, well, she's clearly 17. I don't know how he knew that. D'Angelo McNeil, 13,578 uses. She poured it into her sheets. For D'Angela, that's 60,000 hours in bed, sleeping in it, 
for 30 working years. Think about that. That's 30 working years of time. You divide those hours by eight. She was sprinkling her sheets. And again, Hopkins said, no, I've never heard of people putting it in their sheets. Well, I had to show him the document, the Johnson & Johnson document, where they had actually interviewed women who put it in their sheets. Mr. Ronnie, 16,787 uses. I remember he said he was using it when he was playing football because it got a little sweaty. There is substantial asbestos exposure from cosmetic top. One, because it's the most ultimately friable material probably that's ever existed. It is a bottle of dust. So it's not like other products where they're bound in some sort of plastic or matrix. It freely comes out and it takes forever to settle. The top particles drop right out. The fibers are aerodynamic and they stay in the air for a long time. Dr. Longo said that the average exposure, because Ms. Sullivan said there's no exposure analysis here, that's not correct. Dr. Longo said that the average exposure per use is 0.1 to 1.0 fibers per cc, per cubic centimeter, right, that sugar cube. And then Dr. Moline showed us this risk assessment for mesothelioma. This is from a paper uh, called Markowitz, where they looked at four different studies for extremely highly exposed people and very low exposed people. And check this out. For people exposed to a cumulative dose of greater than zero to 0.15 fiber years, they had a four-fold increased risk for mesothelioma. For people exposed greater than zero to 0.15 in this study, the German study, there was a 7.9 times increased risk. So even extremely low levels equal a very high risk. So this is over background. So for people with no exposure to asbestos, their risk is one. Okay? For someone with even low levels, it's somewhere between four and eight. That's for these people who were exposed to this. And then, of course, Hopkins said, baby powder isn't dusty. Remember, I, asked, I was like, can we agree baby powder is dusty? No, nope, can't agree with that. That's why I had to show the commercial, right? I mean, Ms. Sullivan said, oh, they were just, I don't know. I forget what she said. I had to show. I had to stop and say, well, okay, you don't think it was dusty? Let's show you your own commercial. And then this document, 3695-81, insights and implications. Powder is messy to use. Let's add a cloud of dust when you put the bottle down. It goes everywhere. Can't aim it where you want it. Let's add a cloud of dust when you put the bottle down. It's dusty. We all know it's dusty. I don't know why Dr. Hopkins decided to fight on that. So, Douglas, David, D'Angelo, and William all had substantial asbestos exposure from Johnson & Johnson. They were exposed hundreds to thousands of times above background and thousands of exposures each. D'Angelo was sleeping in it. And they were all exposed as infants and children. Again, we cannot lose sight of that. That is extremely important. Remember, Dr. Atanix, inhalation of an amphibole before the age of 30 is disproportionately significant in the induction of mesothelioma. There's no known level of asbestos, especially for children. There can be more than one cause. I think there was only one cause here. Oh, and shower to shower counts as one cause with baby powder, so the angel will use shower to shower, but they're the same company that made them. We've proven causation in this case. Failure to warn and design defect. So we have the inbox and the outbox, what Johnson & Johnson knew and what they told people. And you're on just one or two more slides and then um, you can break. In 1959, this was the first time, documented time, it's in the inbox, doctors said, you should not be using this. Johnson Johnson told the mine, they went to Italy, and they reported, Massey explained that our problem was not a matter of dissatisfaction, but that about one third of the doctors are presently advising against the use of baby towel, inasmuch as starches and oils have a greater purity and there's no dangerous dust to inhale. 1959. David Etheridge was born in 1960, the next year. And then we have Battelle going all the way through the 1950s and the 1960s 
all the positives for Tremolite and Amphibol. And I'm going to end right after this slide. This is where Johnson & Johnson, when they were asked under oath, with the help of lawyers, is there asbestos in Tremolite, they said no. Never contained asbestos in any form or Tremolite. And these are the ones that Nancy Musco signed with the help of the lawyers. And what did Ms. Sullivan say? Somebody just screwed up. Somebody just screwed up. Ms. Musco was deposed, and she never said this was a mistake. The only person who said this was a mistake is Ms. Sullivan. Ms. Musco was told what to say by the lawyers for Johnson & Johnson, and that's where we'll start off uh, tomorrow morning and hopefully finish quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Officer, could you provide uh, those envelopes on those chairs to the jurors who are distributed to the person? So members of the jury, we've concluded today. We're not um, finished yet with the plaintiff's opening statement. We'll complete that tomorrow morning. And at that point in time, after that's completed, I will issue the charge to you, go over the verdict sheets, and you can begin deliberations. So tomorrow, um, please be here by 9.30, so that we can start as promptly as possible after that. Uh, remember, uh, no discussions with regard to this case. It's not yet time to deliver. No research of any kind whatsoever. Have a good night. Thank you for your patience, your diligence. I'll we'll see you in one thirty. about I looked in the reports and there's five points. They're in evidence. 
So I'm referencing evidence that's in evidence that the jury can verify, but everything else I'll respond to in writing when it comes. Thank you. I just have to say one thing yes. about the different views. Counsel has been given every benefit of the doubt all the way through this trial. Um, if I would even tread where counsel has gone, I don't even think I would go there, but to say that there are different rules is just not fair and not true. Thank you. The court agrees that in its application of the rules, even me, counsel has been warned. At this point in time, uh, counsel are responding to the comments made with regard to them, which is appropriate for them to defend themselves. So we are off the record. I'll see everyone tomorrow morning at uh, 9.30 as we've instructed the jurors. If there's any other business earlier, just please advise.